Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first Millsboro evangelistic series entitled The Key to Unlocking the Kingdom of Heaven. How's everybody doing today? Well, I tell you what, God's brought us back once again. It seems like we didn't ever leave, didn't it? Time just goes by so quickly. But praise God, if you're joining us tonight, you can just inhale and exhale and thank God for the breath of life. So tonight, we are going to continue our series on part 10. That's right, part 10, the nature of humanity. Last night, we talked about Christian behavior, and, and, and maybe somebody last night after we left was just kind of wondering, like, wow, why can't this Christian behavior be so easy? Well, you would have thought that this would have went before that, but however... I just wanted to give you a taste of understanding that don't be so hard on yourself, even though we've learned that, you know, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that there was a reason why our nature is the way it is without God. So tonight we'll talk about the, the nature of humanity. So before we go into that, we will be blessed tonight by a musical instrumental selection given to us by our very own musician and pianist, Brother Bobby Bull. God bless. the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to thank those of you that are joining us once again from Facebook and Zoom. I want to thank Brother Bobby Bull for that beautiful selection. 
And as we go in tonight, tonight, once again, it's part 10 of our evangelistic series, volume one. Remember, we got another volume to go through in the next couple months, and then that will prepare us for this grand revival that we will be having in the fall by God's grace within his will. So, as I invite you also to continue to have your Bibles with you, have some writing uh, utensil, not utensil, but writing and pads or wherever you're typing up on your uh, computers, laptops, and let's enjoy once again learning more about the Word of God and where we are in this uh in this universe, in this earth, what, what kind of role do we play? So, tonight, we're going to talk about the nature of humanity. As we've been starting out each week, each day of the week, we had talked about how knowledge is power. It is the essence of how we get to learn what we know and how to utilize that knowledge for our own good. We realize and understand that knowledge, uh, it's a natural thing for all of us to acquire knowledge. And the reason being for that is that without knowledge, would we be able to assume or get things done uh, uh, properly? Of course, there's some individuals that think that they are so knowledgeable that you can't tell them nothing. Have you ever met anybody like that? Like, you can't tell them anything. They know everything. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight that as Christians, we don't know everything. And as somebody who does not have a relationship with God, praise God that you are here, you're watching, and you're getting an opportunity to gain some knowledge tonight. And so with that, sorry, we understand that our text for our theme is Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 which is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. How many of you uh, uh, just put it in the chat or raise your hand wherever you're at how many of you who are watching right now are gaining some knowledge of the word of God? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so guess what? It's not foolish to gain knowledge from God. And so all knowledge is making us wiser in our walk with God each and every day that we have prayer with the Lord, when we have devotion, as we're studying our Bibles, as we continue to walk with God, we're becoming wiser because we are taking the time to acknowledge his instruction. And where does that instruction come from? Yes, God can talk to us. But guess what? You won't really know how to talk with God unless you're reading the Word of God. What do you mean? Well, the thing of it is, is the Word of God enhances our understanding on how we talk, walk, talk and walk with God. And so the first thing we came to realize was that the Holy Scriptures within this book, the 66 books in this Bible gives us all the instruction that we need. Listen, if you want to have action, drama, romance, controversy, violence, love, all kinds of things, you can find that in the Word of God. The Word of God is better than any Netflix special. Amen? And believe it or not, you can watch a documentary over and over again until you don't want to watch it again because you're saying, I've already gotten everything out of it. But with the Bible, it continues to enhance our learning. You never stop learning the Word of God. And so last night we talked about Christian behavior. And we started out with Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who said, Behavior is the mirror in which everyone shows their image. And we asked the question, what is behavior? And we come to realize that behavior is basically our conduct, uh, our, our disposition, our compartment, uh, I'm sorry, comportment to refer to one's actions before or toward others. So can we have a nasty attitude towards a person? Can we be happy towards individuals? Is it depending on where we're at and what circumstances our behavior affects, not just ourselves, but our behavior can affect others. Would you agree? And so what we discussed was we need to have 
a Christ-like behavior. Well, somebody might say, well, I want to be my own person, you know. I don't want to follow after someone else. Well, I would say this. I was brought up to say, be a leader, not a follower. Amen? Okay. Why? Because at times, as human beings, we can choose to follow the wrong influence. Amen? Uh, we see that nowadays when individuals are looked to be stars and they're, 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 uh, they're looked upon to be bigger than life. And you can actually go to a concert and see individuals praising and worshiping. Amen? And, and, and so the thing of it is, is that uh, we can find ourselves following individuals into doing the wrong thing. Peer pressure. When you're younger, uh, some of us, many of us, made a lot of mistakes because we followed the wrong crowd. It's better to be a leader than a follower. However, there is one individual who is the best leader we've ever had come into our lives, which it is best for us to follow because when we do follow God, right, he chooses, if we're willing to accept it, to make us leaders to help others bring into a following into the love of Jesus Christ. So we talked about what a Christ-like character is, and we came to realize that that character, right, that character is good. Is Christ's is Christ character of evil? No. Christ's character is of love and of sacrifice and of selflessness. Not selfishness, but selflessness. The Bible tells us that we are all sinful, that no one is perfect, right? And that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But praise God that Jesus became the atonement for us so that we understand that in this life, he showed us as he lived on the earth as a human being that we can be good people. Amen? We can be good people. We can fall. I guess it's a song that it was out, Donnie McClurkey said, we fall down, but we get up. It's a, true, it, 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 it's a true statement about our lives here. Can you imagine if there was no Jesus that many of us would quit on life? There, the suicide rate would be higher than what it is. You want to know why? Because we would feel as though there's no hope. But with a Christ-like character, we understand that what? God is love. God loves all of us. And we understand that God, right? God loves us so much that what does John 3.16 say? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But we have to understand something. We can't just sit down and expect God to do it all for us. We have to cooperate. And that's why we talked about it, uh, about faith without works is dead. Now, some would say, you, don't, you can't work for salvation. That is very true. That is true. But what are we looking about work? Are we talking about working and, 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 and doing our best to say, look what I did? Or are we talking about working together as a team? Are you hearing me? Because that's how we have to do it. We have to have a human and we have to have a supernatural uh, 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 coming together of us and God. Amen? Would you agree? And so God gives us that helping hand. And we understand this is that if we follow Jesus' will, right? The Bible says by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. My, my. Somebody last night might have said, you know what? Am I showing a Christ-like behavior? As one that will profess and say they're a Christian. Now, this is not condemnation or judgment. All I'm just saying is I have to learn for myself. There's times the Lord has to say, David, you better get it together. That's not how you should have felt towards that person or said that. So I, I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit, how can you say, let me put it this way, the Holy Spirit brings an adjustment within our own consciousness to say, I'm wrong. A Christ-like character is able to um, look in the mirror and say, I'm wrong. Is able to tell somebody, I'm sorry. Is able to accept forgiveness 
And so we have to be of that, of the image of Christ. And where did we find out that the fruit of the spirit is to have joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all the above is of the same character of God. C.S. Lewis said last night from the Chronicles of Narnia, humanity, I'm sorry, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It's better to think of others outside of yourself at times. When you're in a marriage, you can't be selfish, you have to be selfless, right? If everybody was selfish in this world, we would have a lot of problems. We already have enough. But imagine if we only thought about ourselves, we would live, you would think the world is miserable now, it would be chaos, but we are getting to that type of world. We're already there. We are at the doorstep of Jesus coming back. We're living in these last days where we find all kinds of selfishness. And so bottom line last night was as we talk about Christian behavior, Christian behavior is all about selflessness. It's all about loving one another. It's all about having a mind like Jesus. Now, as I mentioned earlier, somebody last night might have walked away and said, wow, man, this is a hard thing to do. Why is it? Well, we'll answer that question tonight when we talk about what is the nature of humanity. Let us pray. Father in heaven, for the next few moments, Lord, we just want to thank you for allowing us to come together. And so now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray once again that you humble us. May you forgive us of our sins and blot out our transgressions. May we be sincerely repentive of those things that may hold us back, things that you were not pleased with. But Lord, thank you for being a loving God a gracious God, a merciful God. And so tonight, once again, Lord, give us the comprehension and understanding of the reading of your word. And may we not just be hearers of your word, yet may we be doers of your word. So now, Father God, we give you all honor, praise, and glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Let everyone say amen, amen, and amen. What is the nature of humanity? So if we understand anything about humanity, man and woman were made in the image of God with individuality, the power and freedom to think and do. Though created free beings, each is an, is an indivisible unity of body, mind, spirit, dependent not independent, dependent upon God for life and breath and all else. Did you know that you don't have to think about how you have to breathe in and out? Absolutely not. Because it's, it's, it's not uh, voluntary, it's involuntary. Do you know that it's not up to you whether or not God will wake you up and give you the breath of life? It's all in God's hands whether you wake up. The alarm clock does not wake you up. The internal alarm clock does not wake you up. Your, uh, your infant child cannot wake you up. Your spouse cannot wake you up. Your mom and dad, the only reason we wake up is a by the grace of God. And so when our first parents disobeyed God, they denied their dependence upon him and fell from their high position. The image of God in them was marred and they became subject to death and their descendants shared this fallen nature. Somebody might say, what are you talking about? I know my parents. Well, we're not talking about the, your, 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 your earthly parents right here. There were two individuals in the very beginning that were brought into existence here on this earth by the name of Adam and Eve, and we will get right to them tonight. And so as we look at the word of God, we talk about where did humanity come from? Well, in the word of God in the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, it says, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, 
and the man became a living creature, or basically, this is the English Standard Version, a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, and in the east, there he put the man whom he had formed. Now, we talked about this already, about how creation, right? This is just review now, that man was created from the dust of the ground. God took his time, and, and he created man, and he breathed in him the breath of life. So, the first step in understanding who we are as human beings is understanding where we came from. Next, it said, first, we are created beings who owe our very existence to God. I know some of us say, man, I'm so glad my parents came together because I am who I am. Well, believe it or not, even though your parents came together to create you, it is through God who gives you the life so that you can have life. Some people might be like, huh, that doesn't make sense. Well, it makes a lot of sense because God is the one that's in control of life. He's the creator. But isn't it magnificent how God can take a male and a female and bring them together to be able to form life? Now, it doesn't always happen for every male and female because of the sinful world that we live in. There are some, uh, there are some imperfections within our systems. And unfortunately, there's times that the devil would have us feel as though that we are, how can I say, we are... Um, We don't have the capability. A lot of times when we can't do the things that we would like to do, we'll beat ourselves up as though it's my fault. But yet, when sin came in, and we'll talk about that, sin is the one that gives us the inability to be able to do certain things. It is because of sin that maybe a woman or a man are unable to help produce a child. It's nothing that you have done. It's just that this is what has happened. You know, when somebody is born with a disability, it is nothing that you have done. Now, there are reasons where some can have it because either you're drinking or smoking, whatever, drugs, this and that. But outside of that is that there are just some things that happen in this life. And what Satan would have us do is just blame God for everything. Are you hearing me? Blame God for everything. But however... We have to understand that it is he who made us. We are no more a result of random chance than a beautiful sculpture and a result of a bunch of rocks being knocked together. Talking about, listen, when we talked about the Big Bang Theory, God, when he creates, he has an idea for why he creates everything. So there's a reason. So now second, we are unique individuals in that God was personally involved in the creation of humanity. Remember, it, the Bible says that God created man from the dust of the earth. He didn't speak man to existence. He really came in and took man and formed him and created him. And he took a lot of effort and time to create this perfect creation. And everything else on earth, the stars, the plants, the animals were spoken into existence. God took time to reach into the earth and sculpt the first human being. Now, I can't even imagine what Adam and Eve looked like. You know how we look at some individuals and be like, man, that individual is gorgeous, or that person is handsome. I truly believe, Brother Bull, that Adam and Eve were probably the most beautiful people that you have ever seen in your life. It's crazy how perfect they were. I can't imagine them being some shriveled up, shrill, and frail individual. I see them being the epitome of not like Mr. Muscle, but they were a perfect creation. And a lot of times we're trying to seek the perfection. What's sad about in this world is that uh, 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 in our human nature, we try to uh, determine what's perfect. And so 
What happens is we come into this world in different sizes, different shades, different colors, you know what I'm saying? You know, different heights. And, and the thing of it is, is nobody's perfect except for God. And so what does it mean to be created in the image of God? Well, I used to have this thing thinking about we created in the image of God, right? Created in the image of God, would it be like looking into a mirror and then you look at yourself and like, look at myself, I'm created in the image of God. God would look like me. If you were to talk to God face to face, it would just be like this body with a mirror and you could see it. However, it goes deeper than that. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds and of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male. Now we understand that that wasn't it. Amen? Amen. That wasn't it. And then the Bible says, and God blessed them. Oh, I'm sorry. So God created man, right, created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be what? Fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish and the sea and over the birds and of the heavens, over every living thing that moves in the earth. Remember now, God tells them was well, specifically speaking to Adam you have dominion over everything so when they walked up on animals animals would come up to them when you jumped in the water and the fish were over there they, they the fish are swimming with them they had dominion I can only imagine when we say trees are alive I'm not saying that there's a mouth and eyes and nose and everything else like that. But can you imagine if trees have life the way they do, that the senses of Adam and Eve could actually just hear and listen to nature, talk to them. You know, they say that you can talk to your plants and there's this reaction within the chlorophyll that reacts, that is showing that it's a living organism. That's deep. They need sunlight just like we do. They need water just like we do. The only difference is we have a mind. We can talk, you know. We have the ability to know right and wrong, but this plant, which is alive, still resides on having to be dependent on the sun and water just like us. That's amazing. So what does it mean to be created in the image of God? Well, what it means is that we were created with consciousness. Mm. You see, when we can process things voluntarily and make decisions based on the sensory information we take in. Two, we were also made to be creative. God created the earth and gave us the ability to create things within the earth. Though God is the provider of every material we can use he made us able to express ourselves through the work of our own hands we were created to exercise authority while ultimate authority belongs to god he also gave humanity responsibility he asked adam and eve to do what care for the earth too many a times the nature of humanity now is destroying the earth it's sad that we pollute our oceans It's sad that we pollute our own areas that we live. I can drive up the street and it's sad to see that somebody would throw a whole bag of trash outside just so they will say, well, you know, the animals will get to it. But why do we not care about nature? I remember at one time it was told that if we're not careful, all the trees would be destroyed. When I was younger, I thought by the time I become an adult, we would only have a few trees. Am I the only one? I was told that, listen, there was an image of earth all green and everything, and then all of a sudden, with all the pollution, it was just desolate. And there's movies out there of this post-apocalyptic type of situation where we've, we've, we've outused all our resources, coal is gone, the water is limited, food is all this, and, and, and people laugh and think, but guess what? That can become a reality very quickly. If it's up to God, because guess what? We have become so dependent on those things rather than God. What do we do when all those things run out? Who do you depend on then? 
And so we have to understand that just as well we're supposed to take care of our bodies, we're supposed to take care of other people, we should be doing our best to help take care of our environment. We were given the ability to choose. We can choose what we give our attention or love or allegiance. God didn't want us to be programmed to just follow him. He only wants our hearts if we are willing to give them to him. God does not want automatons or basically robots. He, just wasn't, he does not want us to follow him because he said so. He wants us to follow him because he wants us to love him, respect him. God's not a dictator. God will not strike you down because you choose not to follow him. That's what Zeus would do. Remember we talked about why God said, uh, thou shalt not serve any other gods? Because you'll serve another god only because you're afraid that they're going to hurt you. And guess what? Zeus doesn't exist. Which was a Greek god. And many individuals live their lives in fear. The only reason we should live our life in fear is not the fear of being afraid, but the reverent fear of being in love with God. So God gives us the opportunity, which we come to understand is free will. So if anybody ever tells you, God, I, I don't, I don't want to be a Christian. I, I, God doesn't control my life. That's very true. You have an option for him to help how can I say, God can control, but yet he's not going to force you, but he will work with you if you're willing to work with him. Does that make sense? That's what he's willing to do. And so how did humanity become corrupt? Well, here, here we go. We're getting into why it seems like, you know, Christian behavior. We got into all this, but here's the thing. Our behavior from our first two parents was immaculate. It was great. They were obedient. They were spending time with God every day. They would have their devotion together. They were enjoying themselves. But however, when God first created perfect human beings, he gave them many gifts. The Garden of Eden was intended to bless humanity. All the creatures were peaceful and their plants for food. Oh, man, it was a lot of salad eating back then. You get me? Uh, but if he wanted this race of beings to truly love him and accept Love from him, they must be what? Able to choose him and in order to be able to choose, choices must exist. My, my. The Bible says in Genesis uh, chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall what? Surely die. Now, many of us, even if you've never stepped into a church or ever opened the Bible or never prayed in your life, many people know about the story of Adam and Eve. Because there's always the joke about the, the, the fruit was an apple. Now, I don't know where they got that from. Maybe because apples are a popular fruit. And I, and I felt so bad for somebody when they were in a study and, and they were like, yeah, when, when Eve gave Adam the apple and then people started laughing and, or some individuals were like, what are you talking about? But that's the story that has been told, right? There's more focus on the apple than it is on the focus of the deception that happened. And so what happens is the serpent, what does he do? The serpent is a medium for Satan, which is the deceiver, which is the individuals we do not want to listen to, it is the wrong spirit. Anything that is not of the Holy Spirit is the wrong spirit. Amen? And so, he weasels his way in and he says, God says that you would surely die? Wait a minute, man. You can look at it. I'm touching it and everything else. Are you sure about that? And basically... What he was telling her was trying to be as though God is keeping something away from you. She didn't feel so perfect. And so when we look at Genesis 3 and 5, it says, unfortunately, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, allowed themselves to be talked out of obeying God's warning. 
They were tricked by the devil, deceived by his fancy words, and lured in by the idea of being like God, knowing good and evil. They were already like God. That one was so tragic about that. They were already like God. And unfortunately, if you spend your time talking to the devil, you will get yourself caught up in some trouble. Never give Satan the time. What do I mean? Never, whenever you are feeling convicted of not doing the wrong thing, whenever God is talking to you through the Holy don't do it. Don't do it. Because God already knows that if we spend too much time trying to have a conversation with the devil, you will not say no. You will eventually sit there and be like, you know what? God won't know. That's crazy to think that. How in the world can you be so manipulated that God will not know? Basically, when Eve eats from the tree, it's almost as though she's like, God won't know. God doesn't care. Or basically, you get to the point where you're saying, I don't care what God thinks. I'm going to do what I want to do because he gave me that free will. But I caution you. With free will, you must use common sense. And that's why the Bible says, back in Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. God gave Adam and Eve the knowledge that they needed. But guess what? Because they despised that instruction, they became foolish. which sent us on this domino effect that affected everybody in this world. It says, they fell for Satan's deception, and by eating the forbidden fruit, they committed the first sin, choosing self over God. How many of us do that? How many of us choose self over God? We do it a lot of times and may not even know it. But there comes a point when God is like, ah, 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 stop doing that. But guess what? How do you get around to stop doing some things? What happened to you when your mom and dad said, don't touch the stove? Well, you wanted to go up there, you touched the stove, you already know it brings heat, but yet you want to see for yourself, and guess what happens? You either burn yourself a little, or you're over there at the emergency room. And so we have to be very careful, especially following instruction. The beautiful thing about God is he doesn't just let you come into the world and you go in an incubator and you just grow up and then you go out there. God provides you with parents. Isn't that something? He provides you with parents so that you can learn right from wrong if you are fortunate enough to be born into a family that, 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 that will nurture you that way. Are you hearing me? God doesn't allow us to go out wrong. And the crazy thing of it is, is that when we're born into this world, the Bible says we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity due to the simple fact that the ones that was given dominion, meaning Adam, wasn't so much when Eve ate from the tree, it's when Adam ate from it, it, just, it, it caused this chain reaction of dysfunctional human beings, dysfunctional animals dysfunctional weather, dysfunctional situations, violence occur. There was no animals eating other animals in the Garden of Eden. Sin, because of the disobedience of God, when God gave Adam the dominion, basically Adam gives dominion to Satan now. And now when Satan gets dominion, what do you think Satan's going to do? Cause chaos. Where there was order, now there's anarchy. And so we see why our humanity is so corrupt. And it says that, and it says that eating the fruit did exactly as the serpent said. Mankind learned that it actually meant to know both good and evil at the same time. Adam and Eve didn't know evil. They only knew good. But what is it about evil? What is it about that we're attracted to? Huh? Now, we would say, now, now that, that might be an odd question. What do you mean we're attracted to evil? Well, there's a lot of movies out there that depict evil and individuals enjoy watching it. There are some individuals who, the reason you have a serial killer, 
which is evil, is because they get an adrenaline rush from killing individuals. Let's be honest. In our human flesh, we like drama. We like to be petty. We like to gossip. We like violence. If you don't believe me, you can go on YouTube or, or you can watch the news and you can see now we will take our phones and watch somebody get beat to death rather than try to be on the phone dialing 911 or even yourself trying to break it up. Now, we know that the peacemaker, they always say, peacemaker always the one that gets killed. What I'm saying is, I'm not saying you jump in front of the bullet of an individual, but when you're seeing little kids, you have individuals videotaping little kids, watching them get into all kinds of trouble fighting. We enjoy these things, UFC, Guys and women knock each other's head off until they're bleeding. For whatever reason, we have become savages within our nature once we found out what evil was like. And the crazy thing about it of it is, we're more, it, it, it's, it's easier for us to hate than it is to love. That's crazy. If you don't believe me, be at work. And somebody comes in all jolly and happy. You know what some people will say? Why are you so happy? That doesn't make any sense. Why shouldn't they be happy? It's because our nature has been turned upside down. We're used to being upset. We're used to being stressed. We're used to being having high anxiety and we're used to being mad. We should not be used to that because God never intended for us to be in that kind of situation. And with that single decision, the stable connection between God and humanity was severed. Sin severs us with our con connection with God. No longer were they a family. It was so bad for Adam and Eve. Imagine this. It was so bad for Adam and Eve that they tried to hide from God when they disobeyed him. And God played the game with them and said, where are you? Knowing where they were at. But what God was really trying to find out is what is going on in your mind and in your heart? Because every day we were having devotion. And for some reason now, you've decided that you don't even want to be close to me. But the one thing they realized was something was wrong. They feared God for the wrong reasons. And once God's presence was removed, sin swept in like darkness, filling a room when you turn off the lights. Nobody likes to be in the dark, amen? And basically what happens is, without God in their hearts, sin and selfishness consumed humankind, and this quickly, the world, this quickly brought the world into disaster. Wow. How many of us have made the mistake where everything was going great, but we did something that we should not have done, and you messed it all up? Marriages fail because an individual is not listening to God, as we talk about the Ten Commandments, and they go out and they commit adultery. And the marriage goes from this blossoming tree to this atomic bomb or nuclear mushroom. 25 years, four children, going great, and boom, it's all over because you made a bad choice. Now there's times when people reconcile, but now we're seeing in this world the divorce rate is going higher and higher, and it's not just over adultery, it's over dumb stuff, it's over money, selfishness. You get me? It's over because one has more education than the other all of a sudden. You know, people are going to school later, and then all of a sudden, there's jealousy. You see, Satan has changed the dynamic of who we are from taking us from being selfless individuals to being selfish individuals. And so, how our human nature affects us today? Well, it affects our world. Why? Because we live in a world where there is constant chaos. 
There's war. There's famine. There's sexual immorality. There's racism. So much that we can go down the list. That is not by accident. That happened in the beginning due to disobedience. And what God is showing us is that living in a life of disobedience does not bring you joy. Are you hearing me? Living a life of disobedience, I know. Living a life of disobedience does not bring you joy. You are not happy. And let me tell you, when you do develop a relationship with God, there's going to be times you're not happy. However, you do have joy because you know of the hope that you have when you stay with him that you can have victory over sin. But if you are in any of these cycles here, if you think that porn is going to make you happy, it's not. If you think that cheating is going to make you happy, it's not. If you think getting over, not doing certain things, what do I mean getting over? Maybe not paying your taxes. Did you know that's evil? You're supposed to do that. Anything that goes against established rules or laws, we remember we talked about the law, right? We talked about there's reason for laws, right? Is a consequence of the fallen behavior that we have suffered through what had happened through the beginning with sin. It says, for in Romans 7, 15, 18, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. This is Paul. This is the Apostle Paul. That's right. Paul. Paul is saying that in his flesh, let me read that again. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. How many of us have we 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 do that? There's some things that you you should not be doing, but for whatever reason, but the thing of it is, is that we have to learn how we have to surrender that to God. It says, without a connection to God, humanity loses the perfection it once has, it once had. Mankind no longer resembles the God they were created to represent, and sin is left to have its way. But here's the good news. Who can redeem us? It can't be easy to think that if we do enough good in our lives or simply follow our hearts, we'll eventually overcome our selfish impulses and reach perfection. The Bible tells us these ideas are simply not true. The Bible says in Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. So the individual who thinks that because they're going out and they're running down to the soup kitchen and they're doing the soup kitchen and they're going down making sure they get the clothes out, these aren't bad things, but you can do all that. And it's not enough to get you into salvation. You can still do all that and be the nastiest person in the world. Are you hearing me? Very true. You had murderers who were doing good deeds, and then at night they were murdering people or even murdering them in the day. It's not about the deeds. It's about who you are in your relationship with God. So you can't work your way into being righteous. It says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? We can't. We can't. Some of us at one point in our lives, we were love sick over somebody and could not figure out why. Now, there are some reasons that play into that. However, it's all because of once again, and we'll go into that later, there are certain things we should not be doing until it is the right time to be with somebody to do those things, which can cause those kind of confusions of being lovesick. If we relied on our hearts to do what we want to do, 
We would do the things, like Paul was saying, that I don't want to do, that I do. What Paul was trying to make clear is that if it's up to me, I won't do the right thing unless I connect myself with God. So God knows we cannot trust our own hearts or that all the good we do in a lifetime cannot make us righteous. Does that mean mankind is doomed to be flawed forever? Praise the Lord, not. Because guess what? God had already come up with a way to redeem us and restore the lost connection we once had with him. Praise the Lord. He did this with what? His only son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only truly perfect person who has ever lived on the earth by taking the punishment for our sins on the cross. Jesus has provided his righteousness for all of us, restoring our relationship with God. Oh, somebody's got to be shouting out, praise God, hallelujah. When If there was any way that you can be saved in this life to be changed from uh, 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 the iniquity that you had been doing over and over and over and over, you have to give it all to Jesus. And I can tell you from life experience within my 50 years is that the only way my life could have changed is by going and following and being as obedient as I can. Yeah, there's ups and downs, there's smiles and frowns, but guess what? Through all that, I know if I fall, I can reach out to God and say, please pick me up. And he will take away certain urges. He will take away some of those consistent uh, idiosyncrasies that you had when you were out there in the world. God can change you, but you have to be willing to be changed and work with him. Romans 5, 18, 21, before we close out, it says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. So one act of righteousness leads to the justification and life for all men. After that one trespass, it took another man, right, in the form of Jesus to redeem us. Man caused the trespass for us to be doomed, but then the second Adam, which we call Jesus Christ, was brought into this earth to redeem us and justify us for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many would be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it does not matter how many people you try to, to, to help out in this world. If you are doing it just because you're trying to get points to get into heaven, you get zero. It's all about still doing that and being in relationship with God. Are you hearing me tonight? So I'm not telling you to stop doing those things. Do them. But don't do them thinking that it gets you brownie points into the kingdom. Just enjoy serving. Amen? Enjoy serving. So, we can't do it on our own. That gentleman right there, the gentleman lifting the weights, he's doing that on his own because he's been training. But guess what? We have to train with Jesus so that we can get into the kingdom. We have to train with Jesus so that we can get something better than a gold medal or a silver medal or a bronze medal. We're training with Jesus so that we can get a crown. We're training with Jesus so that we can walk on streets of gold. We're training with Jesus so that we can be able to live for eternity. We're training with Jesus so that we can be able to see those who sleep in the grave and was resurrected and be reunited. We are training with Jesus so that we can be joyful and happy and have hope and be celebrating that we have had victory. There is nothing we can do to save ourselves. It says God wants to be part of our lives. He wants us to accept his grace and live with him in heaven. But we have to what? Invite him in. We have to make a daily choice to bring God into our lives so he can help us fight 
the selfish, sinful nature we all carry inside us, we have to pray like the psalmist did. And Psalms 51.10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew within me, and renew a right spirit within me. God is willing to create a new pure heart within us. He'll grant us the victory. And when he does, we'll be that much closer to our Heavenly Father and our eventual home with him. Tonight, somebody, I pray, understands that the reason why we talked about Christian behavior last night is because our nature was marred in the very beginning. Love was taken from us. Joy was taken from us. Peace was taken from us. Long-suffering was taken from us. All those things of the fruit of the Spirit were taken from us due to eating some forbidden fruit. Eating the wrong fruit turned us away from demonstrating the right fruit. Praise God that he had an action plan so that we could be redeemed. And so it does take work. What do I mean by that? It takes conditioning. It takes for us to be consistent. It takes for us to be willing to say, I need help. I can't do this by myself. There's some of us that are so prideful that we won't ask others for help. And I believe that's the reason why many don't ask God for help. Because you're even prideful in the same situation with others as you are with God. If only many knew that you ain't got to beg God, you ain't got to pay God, you don't even have to make promises. And there's people that have made promises And when they broke that promise, they felt as though, because the only thing they know is that when you break a promise, it's hard for people to forgive you. But with God, he's willing to walk with you the entire way. So tonight, there's someone out there tonight that kind of understands, wow, that's, that's why I've been thinking like that. Maybe this was a wake-up call. Perhaps you've been so embedded in your drama that I pray that perhaps you came on or even, even in the state that you're in. Listen, just because you have given yourself to God, just because you have accepted Jesus doesn't mean you're not going to have these struggles. Knowing is half the battle. The way you win victory is by just staying in the fight. There's no harder fight in this world than a spiritual battle. Because in a spiritual battle, you got to understand that we're not fighting against flesh. We're fighting against principalities. We're fighting against evil. We're fighting against supernatural forces that are against God. And the only way you fight those things is you got to have God fighting for you. You hear what I said? You can't fight it. You got to have God fighting for you. This is why we have to be studying the Word of God. This is why we have to get our war rooms. Wherever your prayer closet is, you got to have a war room. And you have to be a repentant individual. 
Meaning, also, we got to call the baptism of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's somebody tonight that feels like they're just tired and they want to give up. There's a God that will lift your spirits if you're willing to accept him in your heart. If that's your pleasure tonight, join me in prayer. And if you have prayer requests, just lift them up right now. And we're going to pray for those prayer requests. So I ask that as we go to pray, just clear your mind. Take a moment to clear your mind. Take a moment to inhale and exhale. Take a moment to truly believe that God went through all this to make sure that you, as an individual, have an opportunity to live for eternity with no drama. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you, Lord, for saving a wretch like me. Lord God, some people only see the person who I am right now. But there's a greater story. And it's still being written, Lord. And just like myself, there's a story still being written by someone out there, everybody, every one of us, until you close our eyes, our book is not complete. The pages may not have ink filled on each day, but I know that we have an opportunity to have a happy ending. Lord, I know that we have an opportunity to have a book of our life be filled But one of the most important things about that book is that it's just a small compilation of what you have in store for us for the future. Lord, there's a book that we all want to be in, and that's the Lamb's Book of Life. And Lord, we know that every one of our names can be in that book written personally. by the ink blood of Jesus Christ. So tonight, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit is causing a strong conviction on somebody to say, I want to be cleaned up. I know it's not going to be easy, but I'm learning about myself each and every night. I'm learning that God's word is true. I'm learning that God created me to be special. I'm learning that he gave his only begotten son. I'm learning that there is a comforter. There is someone that is guiding me if I'm allowing it through the Holy Spirit. I'm learning that I am a broken vessel, but I'm learning That through all that, God's word can help put me back together. And so now, Father God, we pray for all those prayer requests that have been lifted up, Lord. We pray that you will grant that you would grant the answer prayer that is needed for every physical, mental, emotional and spiritual affliction that is upon any. So now, Father God, as we go our separate way tonight, 
We pray that you continue to maintain this momentum through this evangelistic series through the rest of the week and that we will look forward to volume two and we will prepare ourselves for our revival in the fall. Father God, thank you for never leaving us nor forsaking us. And as we go our separate ways, Lord, may we be comforted to know that we have victory in Jesus Christ. Father God, this is our prayer. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Let everyone say amen. Amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We want to thank you for joining us on Facebook and Zoom. And we look forward for tomorrow night, which will be part 11. That's right, part 11. We talk about human nature. And then we're going to get into some deep things on what is causing the confusion in this world. Tomorrow night, we're going to talk about this great controversy that is taking place. Amen? This great controversy. And then we'll build from there. See you tomorrow at 730. By God's grace, have a good night and God bless. Take care. Bye-bye.